Welcome, everybody, to the 22nd episode of Comic DNA, on which we will be discussing Ghost World by Daniel Clouds. Published by Fantagraphics in 1997. I am Aaron Walther, and with me, as always, is Luke Thompson Moritz. Thank you very much. And for this episode, we are joined by returning guest Anthony Mathenia. Anthony, thank you for coming back to the show. Hello, everyone. Hello. All right. So, um, uh, Ghost World was first serialized in Dan Clow's anthology, Eight Ball, uh, in the early 90s, uh, from 93 to 97. And Eight Ball was a series that he published through Fantagraphics. Uh, it just contained short stories and other serialized comics of his that uh, would eventually get collected into graphic novels. And throughout the 90s and the 2000s, Klaus became... I mean, I would say one of the premier underground or alternative American comic book artists. Uh, his his work is not really considered to be for the mainstream Marvel and DC readership, but it's it's considered to be more of an academic or a literary comic. Uh, I, we can talk about this more later, Anthony. I'd be kind of curious kind of where you stand on the issue. I'm not particularly a fan of that sort of labeling and compartmentalization of books. And I think these days, uh, now in 2015, we are finally kind of seeing a crossover of the different readerships and a, and a destruction of what can be called a mainstream comic book. But back in the 90s, when Ghost World was first published and when it specifically takes place, there was definitely two different types of comic book readers. Either you read superhero comics or you read the underground alternative stuff. Right, and that's that's at the same time period where you had a quote unquote alternative music coming out mm-hmm. and zines and stuff. So it was kind of the underground comics or modern cartoonists was kind of part of that that movement, and it was it was kind of separate at the time from uh, some what was going on in mainstream comics with Marvel. Right. DC well, and all I mean, that. you know, we're talking about the '90s, and so that would have been like the that like beautiful rise and and horrible fall of the collector's bubble uh you know for like when like comics went from being like a highly sought after item to something that nobody wanted and like the whole the whole industry almost died right there the industry being marvel comics and dc comics and um at the same time period We think now of, like, Image Comics as being like, well, that's the alternative. That's where a story like Ghost World could get published. Mm -hmm. But at that time, that Image Comics is um, basically clones of Marvel and DC superheroes. Oh, right. Anything that's but a literary comic. So (laughs) so you you could start to see why a comic like Ghost World and anything in 8-Ball would have been considered uh, an alternative because really the only place you were going to read... Uh, in different kinds of stories like that was going to be in a in a in a book like Eight Ball. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like it's it's interesting too when you start looking at like the history of the industry, how far Image Comics themselves have come from just being. I mean, you know, they, when they first started out, it was definitely not like highbrow stuff. And as you said, it was just all the most popular guys working at Marvel and DC who just said, "We're just going to do this on our own," and they continued to do what they were doing at Marvel and DC, but on their own. And it was a beautiful revolution in its own right uh, for creators' rights. But uh, nowadays, you look at Image Comics, and they've they've infused that idea of creators' rights and cr- a creator-owned story with the idea that you can tell any kind of story. It, it doesn't have to just be, you know mainstream quote mainstream superhero stuff like they you know there's science fiction crime drama romance comics anything you know it, if if they think it's good enough they'll publish it so uh i'm i'm pretty excited to talk about ghost world i i really really love this book and it's uh definitely not the kind of comic that i mean we're this is the 21st episode and although i don't think we do a lot of quote unquote like the mainstream superhero stuff we do end up doing a lot of it's it feels like we do sometimes like we don't that's what there's the most of you know yeah there's just a lot of it and of course you know we're reading it's 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 also sort of like a trip through my bookshelf which is you know i i i 
as a reader, grew up reading Marvel comics, so that's kind of where I naturally started started from. Right. But uh, Ghost World is one of those books that, like, I really would have. I, I I probably wouldn't have read it when it was coming out in the '90s as a kid. I just wouldn't have cared about it. But um, I found it after high school, and it's it's a book that I that's wish perfect I perfect because it takes place after high school. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a book that I wish I would have read during high school because it just it hit, hit I, a lot of the right notes. Kind of. Well, thing. it it perfectly captures that sort of like misfit teen angst. Yeah. Oh, it, which yeah. Yeah, which definitely, definitely resonated with me. <laughs> me too. So, uh... Yeah, so, um... Yeah, so I guess we just want to hop right into this. Luke, why don't you get us, uh, hit us with a plot description of... Or a Ghost. plot synopsis of Ghost World. Ghost World is a uh, slice-of-life book set in the uh, early to late 90s. I, I wasn't sure on the exact year. Mm -hmm. um, featuring uh, two main characters, uh, Enid and Rebecca... Uh, they are fresh out of high school and making the rough transition into adulthood while discovering who they are and how they plan to spend their lives. That was very concise. Did I miss anything? No, I, I think I think that sums it up. There's there's some themes throughout the book that we will kind of get into. But right, I feel like that will get into the, you know, that'll be in the later discussion. Yeah, but no, that was a nice, concise summation of the characters. Um, and, 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 and listen, if you... That sounds really boring. Just wait till we get into the nuances of this book. Yeah, it exactly. Is you know, Aaron has been making it a point to not tell me much about the books at all because I I, uh -huh. I, I too want to go into the book with a fresh slate. And you know, it, it took a second for the book to warm up on me. I, I wasn't sure about the beginning if I was going to like it or not. And pretty much when it hits like the third chapter, I, I was hooked. Yeah, I think once you kind of get it, that that was the thing. I really didn't get it. Yeah, oh. it's I uh this is this is one of those books that uh I I can certainly see some people just thinking that it's boring and they don't really care about reading a drama story about two kids you know growing growing up and just like the story of their friendship. But like like this the 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 cartooning and like Klaus' mastery of like caricature and the comic page it's a really well told story, and there's so many like uh, he he just like captures the spirit and the attitude of just like cyn the cynical bitterness of of people who don't fit in but want to fit in you know in in their own way yeah and and that's kind of what really connected with me with this book on my first reading, I think what captured me initially and i've read it several times since mm -hmm. then it, it was actually uh for years one of it was my favorite for years um the the dialogue it is very sharp and on point and very very natural yes um j just as you can like look at the uh the illustrations and it's like a fly on the wall drawing people as they're talking mm -hmm. um the dialogue's the same way and i as I write comics, and a lot of people write comics, I think we tend to use dialogue as kind of a way to get from point A to point B to, to impart a little important information and maybe add a little uh, emotion to the story. Mm -hmm. But his his dialogue doesn't go in like that straight line. It um it kind of goes circular. There's digressions in conversation. Yes. And sometimes conversations go off on tangents and don't really go anywhere. <laughs> right. Uh, That's but, what made it you know, authentic. Exactly. I think one of the um, the key panels to me that kind of illustrates that in a single panel is you have a scene where Rebecca and Enid are walking down uh, a sidewalk, and they're basically traveling from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a writer, the tendency may have been just to show them, okay, here's where they were, and then here's where they uh, ended up. But now we, we have the scene of them walking, and we have a panel of, a pair of pants laid out on the sidewalk. Yes. And um, Enid, I think it's Enid, says, look, there's the pants. Mm -hmm. And it seems like a total waste of a panel. In fact, as, a, as an editor of comics sometimes, if I saw that in a script, I would be asking the writer, what's going on in this panel? Why, you know? <laughs> right. What purpose does this serve other than, hey, there's a pair of pants here? But the story kind of has, even in its angle, 
feel this. You have these beats and you have these moments and it just comes across as like two friends. They've been walking the street for a while. They've seen these pants probably every day for who knows how long. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of cements the feeling of um, their friendship, which is one of the key elements of the book. And that with illustration and a dialogue that kind of just seems really random at first, but it, it kind of, uh, when you when you think about it and you get the feeling of the tone, it really, really works really well. So, actually, that thing with the pants, though, is, uh, like, a good uh, representation of one of the great things about the book, which is the... all the little, like, caveats, caveats, that just kind of show the the characters of the town. Because, like, this whole story takes place in an unnamed town, and it's just the story of their uh, Enid and Rebecca's friendship, and they are constantly talking about different things going on, you know, seeing strangers and referencing, you know, little little things in the town. And the pants are one of them. But what I liked about the pants scene was that there was no... There was no setup of, like... There was no setup or explanation where they were like, that's that pair of pants that's always been sitting there, you know, since... for however long. They just said, oh, it's the pants. And then kept on moving. You know, they didn't stop to dwell on it. Exactly. It's not like Family Guy where it's like, oh, there's the pants. And then we go into this, like, digression in this big scene about these pants. Right. And it's not like it, they're not Chekhov's pants later, you know, either it, where they just. Exactly. Back, it, it doesn't. Like later in the story. No, it's just it's, it seems like a total non sequitur. Right. It doesn't mean anything other than the general, I would say, the greater theme, uh, which ties into the the title ghost world which uh, i i would say that one of the main themes of the story is the uh these two girls they're they're right on the cusp of adulthood they just graduated high school and so now they are growing up and they're basically forced to confront the the fact that life changes and things don't always stay the same but and so one of the one of the ways that theme is reinforced throughout the book is that we are constantly shown things that have always been this way in the girls' lives, and so they're constantly focused on like the past, and they're constantly looking at things the way they've always been. And the pants is is a scene that's a perfect scene where they both see the pants and they're like, it's the pants. They know what it is because it's it, the, those pair of pants have just been on the ground, and. It's 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 a constant. The pants are a constant, but their friendship, as as we see throughout the book, their friendship will not be a constant. And that's one of the that's one of the things that they are constantly uh, referring to is the idea that uh, they things they either want things to be the same or they are reminiscing about things the way they were. And so I don't I don't know. I, I just I think that I think that pants panel is just a really beautiful panel. It's such a it's like an inside joke for them that like nobody else would get. What I like about it is that like you were saying it's an inside joke. So it's like it seems like that they the the writer didn't even have to go, "Oh, we should probably fill the reader in with like what's going on." Like Anthony was saying, it just you know, the the writer assumes that, "Oh, okay, they get that." The, the reader gets that these two have tons of inside jokes and that they're super close together. Mm-hmm. So. And it almost kind of reinforces this idea of it's like a, it comes across more documentary, like you're just kind of following along with these people and listening to them. Yeah. And you're just trying that. to pick up what's going along without them like explicitly coming out and explaining it like you would in a, a more traditional narrative. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. I never even would have thought the documentary angle... That, mm-hmm. that does really strike me as sort of documentary. Which well, is kind of weird because, like, in the book, you have these scenes where they're kind of, like, they're following these different people in the neighborhood, like the Satanists and right. these different ones. that They have their own little narrative about, and, like, they're following them, whereas the reader is, in turn, following Enid and Rebecca in the same way. Yeah, there is kind of like that, there's like that layering to the story, because there's this, like, it's almost a voyeuristic nature of us just kind of watching their their friendship dissolve, which I guess we, 
we didn't really explicitly say that, but essentially what the story is about is about Rebecca and Enid growing up and growing apart. Yeah. And right, you have these um well you have two girls who are friends since childhood. Mm-hmm. And I think it's something that everybody who's who's reached adulthood can experience is the fact that you know, even these people that were your friends all throughout school, you know, we kind of mm-hmm. fade, we go in different directions. And kind of the pool of this particular story is we have Enid, who's more kind of in a, a free thinker in Icon class. She's she's uncertain about the future, but she's probably going to forge her own way, whereas mm-hmm. Rebecca is kind of settling for the more traditional, um, get in a relationship with a guy, get a job, start working towards establishing a family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they both represent sort of like different attitudes of independence, but they're they're both at at the point of the story they're both unsure of like which way they want to go. And it, I think another thing with that whole like with them growing up and growing apart, it, what makes this book so great is that it it perfectly illustrates how you drift away from a friendship. It's not like most most people that have old friends they don't talk to anymore. Most times, unless it's like like some kind of like big scene or event, you don't just like stop cold turkey like being a friend with somebody. It's it's a slow process, you know. You just and it's right. Like I said, it's you just drift apart, and that's what this book perfectly captures. Yeah, it does. They have a. They do have a little bit of a blowout, but they come back together. But Nothing's you can just see it's almost like they're, yeah, they're just kind of on two different courses in life, and mm-hmm. yep. there's kind of like a wistful uh, uh, nostalgia towards um, their friendship in the past. But you know, it's kind of they just realize they're in different places. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, I think that's one of the things that makes this such a, I guess, why people would call it a literary comic, because it it really does just capture reality really well. Uh, everything about it just feels so real. Like we were saying with the, with the dialogue, the way they talk, the... I, I, the dialogue, I, I know we already said so, but I just, I'm just going to reiterate, it was so, like, spot on with just, like, the way characters talk. And, uh, it's, it also, the way, the way the story just kind of flits in and out of these different events that happen to the characters over the summer. I really like how the story just kind of, like, it's, it's almost like the, like, little highlight moments of their friendship. Yeah, it's like a little highlight reel, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so what we're really seeing is, like, all the little things that kind of, like, keep them together as friends. Because even Rebecca, you know, Enid questions her about it later in the book. Like, why do you even stay around? And it's, yeah. like, th- there's reasons why they st- why they stick around each other, even though that there's that animosity towards the end of them splitting apart. Mm. So We talked about this with the pants. The other thing I really like is sort of the the way Klaus really captures that sort of like towny situation where there's just like little characters in and out of the story that and like and like we had said like um Enid and Rebecca f- will follow some of them around like they know who these little characters are and they create stories about them and it really I really like that whole like that that ties in with uh Enid's like it's like she's afraid of being one of those characters like she's afraid of becoming a towny character for somebody else, and uh, Rebecca doesn't seem to care so much about that, because like when they have their big fight at the end, like where they both, where where Enid like says like she feels like she has to like force Rebecca to like do everything. Right, right. There's like this perfect melancholy throughout the whole story. I think it's really added by the way that everything's drawn too, like you know oh, talking definitely. about the art and then the way that. Uh, that that he uses the shadows and stuff. It it just has this like I, I I struggle to say gloom, but it it does kind of fit. Like everything mm-hmm. seems just kind of sad. Like yeah, there were certain parts that kind of 
you know, like you were saying, it really hit home with you in some spots. It's the same with me. Like, specifically when she went through that whole uh, punk phase in the yes. earlier chapters, that was pretty much taken directly out of my life. <laughs> it was probably taken out of, like, every teenager's life. Essentially. Uh, and, you know, like you were saying, like, she was afraid of becoming one of those characters, you know? Mm-hmm. But then in that chapter specifically, that was the first thing I thought, was like, oh, she... She's she's trying so hard not to conform. She's kind of conforming to a specific niche sort of thing. Yeah. So, I think one of the important things about the Enid character is that it's not like she has this a plan, clear cut plan for the rest of her life. She's more reacting to what she doesn't want to be mm-hmm. in those ways, like like oh I'm gonna dye my hair and become a punk until she meets this other guy who's like calling her out on it and she's trying to defend well I'm not I'm not that fake punk I'm a real punk and just kind of the absurdity of just latching onto these these identities that we all go through in this kind of struggle to find out um, the kind of person you know that we're going to become yeah yeah um yeah Enid like you said she's she's like really reactionary and it she represents that cynical bitterness of, I mean, it de- it's definitely how I was when I was a teenager. Just, just like having the ability to sort of like see through the like fakeness of culture, but still at the same time having no idea where you fit in that culture, and so you latch you latch onto these like little things here and there, not really like. Like, or just like hoping that it's different enough or not as fake as the other things you see, and that's kind of one of the recurring another one of the recurring themes about the book is that the like the like the growing like fakeness of society, you know, like that she rants about like the magazine in the first chapter. Um, there is something about oh the di- the diner. That's what I'm thinking of. The Which 50s one, the retro diner, diner? Yeah, yeah. yeah, the retro diner. How just like, how just like that's just like completely fake. Like it's it's pretending to be this like 50s diner, and it's barely like a 50s diner. <laughs> and there's there's some other there's there's some other specific like references to just like like the overall like well, fakeness. You, you have the we the the. The supposedly weirdo comedian, and they made the comment of like, "Oh, if he's so weird, why is he wearing Nikes?" Yes, exactly. That's a good one. Yeah, so that's definitely one of the other like recurring, recurring themes. And and one of the funny, the kind of the ironic things is, um, you have like even the people of the town that they think are kind of weird, like like the Satanists. Mm-hmm. You know, they 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 have this mental image that these. This couple, because they look a little off, they're uh, you know, going to the the forest and sacrificing animals or something. So they follow right. them, and then they realize that they're just buying lunchables. Exactly. Yeah, they're just in this giant, big box commercial supermarket. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a, a, another good one. Yeah. Um. Oh, the the character who uh, let's see, what was the character's name? The the kid with the zine. I can't remember his name, but I know who you're talking about. He br- he brings her the the child pornography in the first yeah, second chapter. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness, I can't remember his name. And they they totally call him out on how he's like he's he's uh, provocative and you know he he likes serial killers and Nazis and stuff like that because it you know it shocks people. And they totally like they totally call him out on just being some like needy little crybaby who just needs attention. And that's the only reason he's, you know, he even pretends to be interested in that stuff. It's all just like a put on. His name was John, John Ellis. Yeah. John Ellis. Yes. I also, I think, I think one of the best jokes or like one of the best scenes for me, uh, was when, um, uh, like Rebecca and Enid are arguing, and, and Rebecca's talking about how how cynical Enid is, and how she doesn't like any guys. And Enid brings up the comic book artist that she likes, yes. David Klaus. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's such a cute little cameo. That's such a great moment. 
Well, like, because there's, first of all, like, this is something that Klaus does a lot of, which is he satirizes the popular perception of comics. So you have that scene where she brings up, like, oh, I like this guy, he's a comic book artist. And Rebecca's like, comics, those are stupid, I hate cartoons. You know, and and uh, she's like, no, they're not like normal comics. You know, you don't you don't understand what kind of comics they are. So you have this sort of like satire of what people think comics are. <laughs> and then just the scene of her, uh, Enid's going to go meet Klaus at a book signing. And she's got this image in her head of what he looks like. This like slick, tortured soul artist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she goes right, into right this- out of the beats. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. And then she goes into the store, and Klaus draws a caricature of himself. And he's just some, like, creepy-looking pervert, <laughs> like, giving her the weirdo, creepy stare. And and that, like, she doesn't even go she doesn't even go talk to him. She just, like, looks at him. She just sees him out of the corner of her eye, and then, and then like, that's it. She's done. And, and then Rebecca, like, she meets Rebecca, and she's like, what happened with that comic book artist? She's like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was like this old perv. <laughs> As a comic book writer, that is one of the scenes that I've always liked, and not because of the um, satire aspect of it. Right. I mean, I like that, but the, what I like about it is, you know, if I was like writing the scene, it might be the tendency to have okay, Enid, we see her going into the uh, the com or the zine store, mm-hmm. and the next panel, maybe she's approaching him or something like that. But how he sets up the scene is she kind of wanders in the the store kind of mm-hmm. looking at the corner of her eye kind of meanders in one panel over to a magazine rack because she don't want to approach him yet yeah and then we see her pick up a magazine off the shelf while she's looking at him with the corner of her eye mm-hmm. like uh, pretending to look at this magazine while she's checking him out which leads up to this punchline of just this yeah this shriveled <laughs> shrew of a man <laughs> behind a stack of books looking all pathetic yeah yeah it's it's a great scene it Definitely, definitely. One, I think it's one of the funnier scenes uh, because it's just it's just Klaus having fun with himself. Like he's, I think that's one of the things I like about Klaus' work is that he, as as I said before, he's really satirical of the comic book industry, but he's also very satirical of himself. Uh, because like everything in these comics is like really personal. Like, this, this story of, like, Enid and, and Rebecca, I mean, it's basically just the story of how he feels about people and about things. And uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I, read, I saw an interview or a quote where he basically said these are, he made the main characters in Ghost World two teenage girls so that people wouldn't be as disgusted by what the things that they are saying. <laughs> because if you just saw some, like, middle-aged man saying all this stuff, you'd just be like, oh, what a bitter old hack creep oh yeah but but if it's two teenage girls then it's like it's provocative and it's interesting because these girls you know they're smart and they're trying to figure things out but uh i I find that to be really funny uh yeah another thing about the art uh you were saying uh luke just about like sort of the like almost like the gloom yeah it's got like a filter over it well it's got uh it's 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 black and white, but it's not strictly black and white. It's actually three tone because it's it's black and white, and then it's got the like the light blue, almost like lime, not lime green, but like the light blue, almost green uh, tones, like scale on it. Yeah. And uh, uh, Klaus had said that he kind of wanted it to have the feeling of like the whole book to have this feeling of twilight just that time of the day when it's dark out and there's just like the street lights are on and everybody's just sitting in their living room with the TV on. And so you just see that like weird glow lighting the room just from the TV, like with all the, uh, with all the other lights off, just the TV lighting the room. And that is definitely achieved. Oh yes. (laughs) Dead on. Like that would have not been my first thought. Or that mm-hmm. re- wasn't my first thought, it, but now that you say that, I'm refreshing my memory on everything, and it, yeah, that definitely mm-hmm. was achieved very much. Yeah, that's definitely what it looks like. I really like um, after, uh, I guess the near the end of the book, whenever uh, Rebecca and Enid meet up again, and Rebecca's working at the coffee shop and whatnot. Mm-hmm that, like, such an uncomfortable distantness to them. You know, like, 
Yeah. They they ran into the uh, the friend from high school that had the acting jobs early mm-hmm. on into the book, and you know she was just saying, "Oh man, we need to get together sometime. You guys can call me. You have my number, right?" And after she left, all they said was just, "We're not gonna call her." Blah blah blah. It, it yeah. was so sad that I was so attached to these the the two girls' friendship throughout the entire book, and the exact same thing is repeating itself at the end. You know, after their friendship had broken up. It was it was kind of heartbreaking to be honest. It, I spent the whole book just going, "Oh man, these guys are such good friends with each other because they have this mutual hate for everything kind of <laughs> right. thing." And seeing it all fall apart in front of my eyes was really it's rough. sad. I've I've had it happen, you know. I, yeah. I'm sure all of us have. And yeah, it was rough. Yeah, they set that scene up really well when when they when they both meet that mutual acquaintance from school and and she's like oh call call us we'll hang out and they're like yeah we'll do that and then she leaves and they're like we're you know we're we're definitely not doing that That's, I mean I've done that yeah and well and then they and then it's so like you said it's so sad to see that exact same scene playing out between the two of them yeah and, the main character of the book yeah and now they're having that moment where they're like. Yeah, I'll call you sometime. We'll hang we'll out. We get together, and we have to go to that weird shoe store. I think that's yeah, what they said. Yeah, we never did that thing, but so we'll totally... It's, do it's kind of reinforcing that, like, there is still remnants of that friendship there, because they're they're tying that back into the whole, you know, they've got inside jokes on why they think that shoe store is weird kind of thing. <laughs> and then, you know, that that was it. You know, Enid left on the bus, like she said she was going to. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and Rebecca... Starts dating Josh, which that's the character we didn't talk about. Yes, let's get into Josh. They, uh, that kind of becomes like al- almost a love triangle, the character of Josh. Yeah, because when Enid has her big spiral, she goes to try to. Yeah, sleep to seduce Josh. him. Yeah. <laughs> and just crumbles. Uh, he's just, Josh is just a mutual friend of theirs, but he's just, you know, he's just, he's another awkward teenager, uh, but he pretty much does just whatever they tell him all the time because it's just the type of person he is. He, yeah, he caves in. He just caves in, yeah. But yeah, that like, the way they like both kind of like Josh, but they don't really know. I mean, you know, they're kids. They don't really know. What There's an awkwardness in... Y- yeah, it, it, in in the, the awkwardness, uh, yeah. The, the relationship, there's an awkwardness in the depictions of sex and masturbation, mm-hmm. and it, it rings so true. Yeah, especially for that period of time, uh, and like d- less so that period of time in that age. That age, yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly, that yeah, at that time period. You know, that was the first thing that I got was uh, they kept talking about how the uh, main, how Enid might actually be a lesbian, or that Rebecca might actually be a lesbian. So I thought this was going to be a book about. Uh, Where they both, like, discover that they're lesbians. Yeah! And, oh. like, they both just, like, fall in love with each other through the book because that's what I've been conditioned to know through that's reading what, stories uh, like this. A lot, of, a lot of stories like this will kind of do that. Yeah. Uh, but, but, yeah, I did think it's funny how they both brought it up independently independently at different times. Where they're both like, maybe I'm, or one of or Enid, like early in the story, maybe Enid says something like, maybe I'm just gay, I don't know. And then later on, Rebecca says the same thing. And then they're like, oh, don't worry about it. We're not, I'm not actually gay. We're... It's just that Enid's standards are too high. Rebecca says that, you know, the guy that you want doesn't exist. Yeah. So, no, yeah, I, that's what I thought it was going to be just a, this like big self discovery book and blah, blah, blah. And to a degree, they were discovering themselves, but not in that yeah. direction. <coughs> Especially when they introduced the sex store. That's that's really <laughs> when I thought it was going to be like, oh, she's going to realize she's a lesbian. Right, right. But no, that that was just a funny little side anecdote when she no, that the was the BDSM cat mask from the sex store. <laughs> yeah. I found out uh, from doing a little extra reading, uh, they, they were selling Enid dolls for a little yes. bit as a merchandise thing, and one of them had the cat mask on it. Yeah, I thought that was I thought that was nice a little little yeah, Easter egg I mean, for people who read the book. It should be said that Ghost World was uh, incredibly well. I don't know I don't know how incredibly, but it was it was really successful. I mean, um, enough to get a movie made about it. Yeah, they the the movie there was a movie adaptation, uh, but I mean even just like like critically, it kind of changed a lot of people's perceptions in what comics are capable of. I okay. think. 
uh, just because of like the time that it came out. Was this early two thousands, right? Two thousand one. Uh, the book was collected as a graphic novel in ninety seven. Oh wow! Okay, so, even earlier. Yeah, this this would have been like in that period where like Marvel was going to declare bankruptcy, and everybody just thought of comics as like as really bad kind of thing. superhero stuff. Yeah. And this book came out, and it it got some attention from people as as being deservedly. something. Yeah, well, yeah, deservedly, but as being something more than just like trash fiction. Yeah. The what I, I like about the art is that um, I think one one of the things that cartoonists do maybe a bit better than maybe comic book artists is making the characters expressive and being able to read their emotions more. Like in comics, often you know you only got a couple of faces, like that that gritty teeth face. Okay, they're angry and tense and just yeah. uh, the standard mouth, uh, slack jaw. But yeah. these characters, you can read what they're thinking just by looking at the the art, which is what you know the art should read without the words. So I like that about it. Yeah, there is a tendency in like, like I, you know, I hate to constantly be comparing this to like superhero comics, but you know that's that's just sort of inevitable when you're talking about comic books in comparison to just the American comic book industry. But there's such a tendency in like your standard superhero comic to have all of the characters uh, quote overacting. And so it's like you said, it's always like really angry, gritted teeth, or like like crushing, you know, soul destroying, crying with tears like pouring out of them. And um, it's just as a, like a little side note, I I heard a story about um, Chris Claremont and John Byrne because uh, when they were doing the X Men in the seventies, and I think this kind of like might be one of the reasons why that is. Um, cause the way those comics were done was, uh, Chris Claremont would come up with a plot synopsis, give it to John Byrne and John Byrne would basically kind of write it out and draw the whole comic. And then it would be given to Chris Claremont who would script it. And John Byrne didn't like the way Claremont was having some of the characters act in certain scenes. Like he would want them to be conveying one emotion, but the, the dialogue that Claremont would write would not convey that emotion properly. Like they would be like, like uh, it wouldn't fit up with the art the way he wanted, so he started drawing the characters like just like grotesquely over overacting the emotion that they wanted. So like Claremont would have no choice but to make this person angry in the scene because it's just like they're furious, you know. And um, in a book like Ghost World, you definitely don't have that going on. Uh, there is such subtlety in the characters acting. And when I say acting, I mean in the depiction of the the character's expressions, the way they're posed, the way they're you know their the movement of their eyes on the page, like what they're what they're focusing on versus what you're supposed to as the reader supposed to focus on. Uh, it's it's I, I mean you know like we keep saying this or I keep saying this, but it is just really like a really really realistic depiction of life of just yeah. interaction. It's fascinating how comfortable I am, like, viewing this, the life of these two girls. Like, I just, I hopped, it, once I got past the, like, initial warm-up phase, like, mm -hmm. it felt like I knew everything already. Like, you know, the, the, the dialogue did such a good job of feeling natural, but also really filling me in enough that I needed to know. So, mm -hmm. that was, that was really fascinating to me. Like, I... Like we've been saying, you know, a lot of this was, you know, uh, we were all familiar with it uh, from growing up. I never really felt uh, like I'd been in another character's shoes so comfortably as I did these. So Yeah, absolutely. Um... And, and the plot progression, as it goes along, it's just like the dialogue doesn't go like... Um... In straight lines, the plot progression doesn't go in straight lines. It goes in curves. Yeah. Reach, reaching the inevitable conclusion. But, but it's got a flow to it. And one of the things, like as a comic book a writer, we, we try to do is maybe end scenes at the end of pages because mm -hmm. it's kind of like a more natural transition from the for the reader and it's it makes the story uh, a little bit more clear. Uh, what what Klaus does a lot of, you'll have seen transitions all over the page, but never once does the reader get lost, and it and he doesn't have to like use gimmicks and tricks like later that day or at the diner. You yeah, know, you just follow along so naturally 
uh, from panel to panel. And it, it just kind of has this aimless kind of flow to it. And I think that translates to these characters who are, at this point in their life, they, they have their little aim. They don't know where they're going. They're floating through life. They are ghosts. Wow. Yeah, that that That's is super a fascinating. Great, yeah, that is yeah that is a great observation, uh, especially like what you said about like scenes ending in the middle of the page or new scenes starting in the middle of the page or even just like in the last panel of the page, which is which is such a like like I think a lot of typical comic book writers that would just be so wrong. You you know you just just end the scene on that page and start the scene on the next page, but but like you said, it really contributes to just the meandering flow, which really mirrors you know these characters' lives and their friendship. It definitely, it, like 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 you said, it's such a it's such a subtle subtle way to sort of get the mood across. What's what's so neat about Klaus is, um, and to you can pick up Ghost World and read it and really like it, and then pick up one of his other books, you know, Ice Haven or Damn Pussy. Or, and it's a totally different book. It has a different tone. It has a different feel. It's you know it's equally masterful. Mm-hmm. But for him to be so versatile with his his books and really making the work kind of stand on its own as its un- own unique concept, which um, I've read that that kind of has hurt him a little bit because the person who likes Ghost World might not like one of these other books, and people kind of latch on to like one. And it's kind of hard to like put all of his work in kind of a co- cohesive uh, uh, basket. Yeah, that's that is true. Uh, some of his other stuff is a lot more like like biting satire. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely like a, like a different tone. Uh, like because we were talking like with it being underground comics, like some of it, some of it can just be straight up mean satire, you know, which I think is great. I don't have a problem with that, but it's definitely a different tone than you're going to get from something like Ghost World. So, so yeah, I can see how that would be frustrating for certain readers. And uh, the movie that came out in um, 2002, it's worth mentioning uh, mm-hmm. as a bit of comic comic trivia that uh, Klaus is the only uh, comic book writer to have uh, received an Academy Award nomination. Yeah, that's interesting. I I wanted to bring up the movie. Uh, Luke, I know you haven't seen it. Cause I'm going I to now, now that I know I, that they are the I same. I was going to say, if you like the book, I would recommend you watch the movie. It's going to be fascinating, too, to see uh, Scarlett Johansson pre-big like big Avengers fame. Yeah, too. yeah. Is she good in the movie? Uh, that really depends on where you fall on Her scale, whether yeah. or not Scarlett Johansson is a good actress. <laughs> I yeah, she, it, it's at the beginning of her career, and yeah. um, that that says something. And I mean, honestly, she's she almost looks like a child in this movie compared well, she to. Well, she's pretty young in it, I think. Yeah. Um, I I mean I've I've seen a lot of ScarJo movies. That's what we. We call we call her ScarJo in the business. <laughs> in the uh-huh. business, um, I uh, I like her in some movies a lot, and I don't like her at all in other movies. But um, I That's usually where I fall too. Yeah, I think she captures the attitude in the Ghost World movie. Okay, that's fitting for the for the book. Um, interesting thing about the book, or I should say, interesting thing about the movie. Is that as as you said, Anthony? Uh, the screenplay was also it was co-written by Dan Klaus, but the movie it is a very loose adaptation of the book. Yeah, and it is really more of actually just Dan and Terry Zweigoff, the the director of the movie, basically just taking the two characters Enid and Rebecca and writing a new story based off of them, and just taking a few of the like just like a few of the esoteric elements from the book, like some of the towny characters or, you know, like some of the like little events, but tying it to a completely new narrative. Cause there, I think I read that they, the end game there was, they were going to move in together. Yes, okay. exactly. Cause I read a little bit about it when I found out that it, there was a movie adaptation. Mm-hmm. Well, unlike the comic that's um, meandering, mm-hmm. uh, the, the movie adaptations, more of traditional story arc, 
And you have this bit character in the book, um, Bob Skeets, Mm -hmm. who they turn into this new character, um, Seymour, they call him in the movie, who is played very well by Steve Buscemi. Yep. Um, Which is kind of weird. Who becomes a love interest for Enid, which is totally removed from the the book. Um, It becomes more of a love story about with Enid and the Seymour character, who's like a 40-year-old man, which is really weird. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I find really weird about the Seymour character is um, the director, Terry Zweigoff, also did the documentary Crumb. Yes. uh, For the cartoonist Robert Crumb. Yes. And Seymour is almost a composite of the Bob Skeets character in Ghost World, the comic book, and the real life uh, character of Robert Crumb. Robert Crumb, Crumb. yeah, I, I noticed that too. Um, it's it's an interesting thing about the movie because I, I I will I will just go on record as saying I like the movie, but I do not like it near as much as the as the book. I think I think the book just it it tells its story in in such in such a better way for me, like personally, I'm just more, I'm just more in tune with what the book is trying to say. The movie's trying to say a lot of the same stuff, but as you said, Anthony, it's, it's definitely in more of a traditional narrative and it's not really meandering at all. And they kind of, they introduce like constant characters. So like we said of the character Seymour, which I will say that I loved the character of Seymour. I thought Steve Buscemi was great in the movie. Yeah. It's just different. And, uh, you know, I mean, I still recommend it. I, I definitely think it's worth worth watching, and it still plays. It's a lot of the same themes, you know, growing up, yeah. growing apart, fake versus real. Uh, my, I think my favorite scene in the movie that's like not in the book at all is when Enid goes with Seymour to the uh, bar to see the the blues musicians play. And there's like, cause, cause the whole thing is Seymour is an old timey record collector. So he's got a, like, he's, he collects 78s and he's got all these great old blues records. So he, they're going to go see this musician play and he's just, just so upset that this guy that's playing, he's a classic bluesman and he's opening for some band. And so they go and they sit through the set and it's just some old black blues guy who's, playing you know an acoustic guitar and like nobody's paying attention to him everybody's in the bar just like hanging out playing pool this you know the games on the tv and seymour and Enid are the only two sitting there like paying attention to him and then like it gets over and seymour like makes a comment of like like why 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 aren't these any of these people paying attention this is great and then like the next band comes on and, and they're all like yeah you guys ready to hear some blues and they start playing just like the most like radio alternative rock version of the blues ever. Like the kind of thing you'd hear on like modern country stations now. And like the whole bar just starts uh, going crazy. They all start dancing around and they're just like, yeah, this is great. And that, that to me I, is, I, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I saw that as kind of like a, a rip on blues traveler. Yes. But what, what always to this day makes me laugh is like, if I go out to see a, um, one of these, a new country or all country, mm-hmm. and the guys on the stage singing about working on a barge and stuff. Yeah, yeah. That reminds me of this scene because this blues band comes out and they're singing about pick, picking cotton. Yeah, and they're just like such like white bros, you know. You know exactly. It's, and Seymour's just a gas. Yeah, he's just like, what is scene. going on? Yeah, and that to me, as 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 like also kind of a music guy myself. Like, that just perfectly encapsulates that whole, like, real versus fake. You know, there there are people, there are real people out there making real things, and then there are fake people out there that are making fake versions of this real thing. And a lot of people just like an, prefer the fake stuff. There's also an art subplot in the uh, in the film that deals with that real versus fake. Yes, I... And they draw, it, it draws somewhat from uh, Art School Confidential, which was also a movie. But... I was going to say, I really liked Art School Confidential. Uh, maybe not as much as Ghost World. Yeah. Um, but, yeah but yeah, I love that, that art subplot of Enid in the art class and just that art yeah. teacher. Well, because that's a, a... So... In the in the book, they we, they had the scene we talked about where Enid goes to meet Dan Klaus, um, David Klaus, and they that's sort of like the commentary on comics. In the movie, they have the scene where she's 
in the art class, and she has her sketchbook, and she's kind of like a, basically Enid is kind of a comic book artist, like she just draws like cartoons and stuff, and they just, I love that scene with the art teacher, like just talking about how like comics are low art, and art yeah. should aspire to be something higher. And they, yeah, art should be a tampon and a teacup. Exactly, yeah, yeah. It just it forces us to think about things. And just that, that scene uh, where they have the the art piece of just, like, the penciled squiggles on the paper, <laughs> and, and it's, like, some, like, super, like, liberal arts college girl is, like, this is just my reaction to what society tells me as a woman the way I should act. And the teacher's like, this is brilliant. This is what art should be. It's such a beautiful satire of, like, the art world and high art. Uh, which is what, basically, the movie Art School Confidential, which I did like the movie, but basically that whole movie was just that one joke that they did in Ghost World. Right. But it's done It's Ghost done World, well. I noticed that in the Ghost World film, they did draw in some of the other 8-Ball stuff. So Yes, if, they did. If people, like, an 8-Ball... Eight, eight, Eight ball fan or a Ghost World fan, you know, there's there's going to be uh, moments in there that, even though it's its own animal, and it's telling a similar story. There's there's moments, there's Easter eggs, there's stuff that you know mm-hmm. people will be familiar with. Uh, and it's worth is, checking out. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, eight ball is where goes the Ghost World characters were originally featured, right? Yeah, that was that was Dan Clow's uh, anthology comic that he okay. put. So each issue would have just like short stories and then one like long form serial that would okay. go through multiple issues just making sure i was on the same page correct yeah yeah so like yeah a lot of a lot of the other eight ball stuff kind of got absorbed into the ghost world movie and the art school confidential movie i believe but but yeah it's you know it's it's a good movie i i recommend it i recommend the book more yeah i would assume so. i i think the book as as I said, I, there's just something like about the book that just really it, it it almost connects with me in a way that's like hard to explain. Like it's it's kind of a either you get it or you don't kind of a thing. Uh, I had the same reaction, and I'm not going to I'm not in any way comparing these two, but uh, it was sort of a similar thing with me and the movie Napoleon Dynamite. When that movie came out, a lot of people hated it because they just didn't get it. And either when you watch that movie, either you saw yourself reflected in it or you didn't. At least that was that's my opinion. And I think Ghost World, uh, there is a little bit of that going on in the Ghost World book. I do think that Ghost World has a broader appeal than than something like Napoleon Dynamite, because I think there's so much there's so much going on in Ghost World that you can you can just pick it up and enjoy it just as a. Uh, a short little character drama between two characters, but uh, you can also, if you if you want to, you can look at the greater themes of uh, identity, uh, uh, reality, and like the ever changing nature of society and in our lives. I'm really glad I warmed up to Ghost World though, because mm-hmm. like first chapter, I I really wasn't sold on it. Yeah, you know, like I was saying, it it took me a while to warm up, but it was like a complete 180. Whenever stuff started hitting the fan, and like you start to learn the characters a lot more, um, because I really did not want to come on here and say I didn't like it that much, because that's <laughs> that goes against the idea. Yeah, well, I, if if you had not liked it, I would have had a whole list of reasons why you were wrong. Well, I wouldn't have said anything. I was going to be respectful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm really glad that it, I was able to relate to it so much. It, it, yeah. it, it felt like a very personal book. No, I mean, it was a very personal book. But yeah, it is. It was very personal for me specifically. So one last thing I wanted to talk about, like, before we end, was uh, uh, interpretations of the ending. Um, I, as, we, as we said, like, the, the book ends with Enid and... Um, Oh my goodness, Rebecca! Rebecca, thank you. Enid and Rebecca, like their friendship dissolves and they kind of grow apart. And uh, Enid gets on the bus and leaves town. But it's actually, I actually think it's a little bit more nuanced than that because 
uh, what actually happens is a few chapters before that happens, like while they're still kind of clinging on to their friendship, they sit down at the bus stop where Norman is always sitting, mm-hmm. and they realize that Norman's not there. Uh, like after a minute, like they're just sitting there hanging out, and then they're like, "Oh, wait a minute, where's Norman? Why isn't he here?" And they realize, "Hey, they reactivated the bus stop." And uh, I thought that was like a really great. That was like another great moment of how the the world is changing around them, and like things that were constant and that were always the same, like all their inside jokes are no longer. Um, they're no longer there. Yeah. And so, like, Norman just disappears. Like, he's just gone. And suddenly the bus is working again. And so, at the end of the book, she gets on that bus. So, again, that's things changing, and she is, Enid is changing. And uh, I always kind of took the ending to be, you you could maybe say it's a metaphor or even pretty literal, uh, just representation of... uh, them going through adolescence and just growing up and that's that's like the final step of her journey is leaving her childhood behind and uh, like literally moving into adulthood uh, but I have I have read I read something uh, where some fan theories suggested that it was actually a metaphor for suicide and that after like basically after Enid and Rebecca's friendship falls apart that that whole sequence of Enid, she's like walking around town. She's going to the bus stop and she sees the graffiti that say Ghost World, and that's the first like that's when she like she sees somebody painting it and she tries to catch up to them and and she can't find them, and then she just gets on the bus, this this bus that had never existed until just now, and and just leaves town, and then that's like a, a metaphor for suicide. I don't know what did you have what did you guys think about that. Uh, the suicide theory, I think, is it doesn't really fit with the tone of the book because a bit. I think I mean Enid's yeah she's potentially bummed out if that about the ending of the relationship mm-hmm. but she's never shown as being despondent or any like melancholy or anything like that. Uh, I always kind of interpreted the bus as because we don't know where its destination is mm-hmm. that it just kind of spoke to more her as a person who's going to forge her own path in life, even if it's not known. Yeah. Um, like, whereas her friend Rebecca is kind of following oh, that, that general trajectory, you know, find the guy, um, get the apartment, yeah, get the she's, job. Yeah, she's and, following a known path of, you know, yeah, job, house, family, and it's all very localized, you know. She's not, she's not trying to look yeah. outside of the place she already is. Now, Enid strikes me as a person who doesn't know exactly what she wants, mm-hmm. but she knows that what she has, it, it's not doing it for her. Yeah. That that life, that town, those people, even those things that she draws some comfort from, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's it's just not doing it for her. So that in the end, she just gets on the bus, and it doesn't really matter where the bus is going. It's basically just anywhere but here. Yeah, I, I found it more hopeful than uh, than not. Yeah, I, I actually agree. I I always thought the the suicide was the suicide theory was a little bit a little reaching and a little too like too like forced poetic of an ending like. Like there's a there's there's a melancholy throughout this story. Like it's about teenage angst, but as you said, Anthony, I don't I don't think she ever like was like she was never like like depressed. She was just frustrated. Right. One thing that I always kind of thought weird though about those final pages is she looks much older than the rest of the book. How he's drawn her. Yeah, she does. Uh, did you did you guys look at that or notice that? Well, they do. Like that's because that is another thing of like how Enid is trying to, like, settle on a look. And um, and so, like, things like her hair, she's always, like, doing different things with her hair uh, throughout the whole book. And she's, it's almost like she kind of, like, settles on this look, this look of being an adult. Because she's got, like, longer hair. It's not, it's not, like, it's just pretty, like, a straightforward, like, female haircut. And she's dressed pretty conservatively. So she looks like, like a librarian. Y- yeah, exactly. Yeah. She's got her glasses and she's got like a cardigan and and you know a little skirt, and it it is sort of like it, it's almost like she's like 
uh, leaving behind all the different like attempts at individuality, like of like her little like adolescent uh, what's the word I'm thinking of like little affectations to make her stand out, and like, instead like punk, punk rock phase little, exactly little uh, old woman phase yeah, and now she's just like a normal person who's like ready to just be herself somewhere else. But yeah, you're right. I do think she looks older. Yeah, I, I didn't know if that was just something that I was noticing. Or- or if it was because it always threw me when I reached those last pages. Is like, mm. is this a jump in time? Because it kind of felt like a little bit of one. Yeah, I think it's it's not as much like a a literal jump in time as it is like a just like a visual metaphor of that growing up along with growing apart from her friendship with Rebecca. It's it's just supposed to signify that like she's a different person now. Right. I think the thing about the suicide thing, the only thing that I could think that maybe people thought, like, Norman was checking out because he was older. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Cause, or cause, something like well, that. Well, because that is the thing, because Norman sat on the bus. He was this old guy who just sat on the bus stop, and then he just disappeared. And you can... There is, there is like, a... There are, like, a few little, like, few little themes about, like, death that comes with growing up. Because there, there's Norman, you know, the, the old guy who's kind of, like, senile, who just sits at the bus stop all day. And there is that the uh like the the Bob Skeets thing where they the, Bob, the, when they play the prank on him about the misconnections like they they set up a blind date with him and he shows up and realizes that he was pranked and he leaves and then uh Enid later in the that's story actually, that's actually not Bob Skeets in the book that's not Skeets uh you're right. It's that is. Other... A, you're right. That is a different guy. I, I'm getting the movie confused. The movie confused. Yeah. Me. The movie. Yeah. yeah. The movie confused me. You're right. It is. Bob Skeets is the guy that like wanted to give her the reading, like the astrology reading, because yeah. he gave her his card. But um, like later in the story, they call him. She calls him to like. Uh, I think they were gonna play a prank on him or something, and the number's disconnected. And there's this sort of like this like this like uh, idea that like something happened to him like maybe he died or maybe he committed suicide I forget why but then later she just sees it and and she's like oh I thought something happened to you it's it's great that you're okay and then he kind of talks to her and he like reads her future but of course you know he only can give her like vague like vague feelings they would have to do a full session for him to you know yeah. which, which of course she's not going to do because that's you know he's a shyster, but well, I that's just my opinion. The book the the book doesn't actually do any anything to imply that he's like I I just personally don't believe in astrology or anything like that. But um, but yeah, so there is kind of this theme of like uh, death and finality tie kind of tied into the theme of like growing up and changing but it's never it's i don't think it's too dark and and as we said i i do think the suicide is just a little reaching uh it makes it much makes much more sense of just her growing up and becoming a different person she's taking like, the first step to that, the rest of her life yeah kind of thing like on that final page where they show her leaving on the bus mm-hmm. and the bus element, like every other element in the story, is just completely well. It comes across as random. Yeah. You know, we see we see uh, Norman, and that's not even his real name. Right. Um, that's just what they call him. At a, at a bus stop in one panel, and then it's just kind of a throwaway moment, and then in the end, she she gets on the same bus. Mm-hmm. But um, no, at that that final page, there's there's an acceptance where she sees Rebecca. Yes. And uh, Josh. And she also looks older, mm-hmm. and and she just makes a comment like, "You've grown into a very beautiful woman." Mm-hmm. So there's no like, there's no angst or despair or right. bitterness it's, there. It's just it's more just it's like an acceptance. Yeah, exactly, acceptance and understanding. Yeah, I, yes. I agree. There was one thing uh, in the movie that was like a visual aesthetic that I did kind of like that they don't, um, excuse me, that they don't like really do in the book. Which was in the mo- the movie, the ending is basically the same. Like their their friendship dissolves, and Enid goes to the bus stop. Except in the movie, they don't do they don't make any implication that the bus stop is just is reactivated. She just goes to the bus stop, and a bus pulls up, and there's nobody else on it, and Enid gets on the bus and leaves town. So if, I guess if you're looking at the movie ending, you could maybe impl- you could 
it'd be easier to take that as sort of like a a visual a metaphor for suicide because it's like a ghost bus essentially but uh, that's like that's not in the book at all in the book you don't even actually really see the bus it's just the one panel of the bus pulling up and then the last panel you just see the bus driving away right to me it just kind of speaks about the unknown future mm -hmm. you know we don't we don't know what the future is going to be for Enid she doesn't know what the future is going to be for her but she's going to she's going to you know she's, she's the kind it. of person that's going to jump on a bus and see where it goes exactly yeah yeah it's it's a good book. Yeah, um, it's a very, very good book. I think I think to this day it remains one of Klaus' like most high profile works. Uh, other than maybe that that short story he did that Shia LaBeouf ripped off. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh right. I, that was him. Okay. Yeah, that was that was Klaus. Now that yeah. I know who that is, that makes it even funnier. Yeah, exactly. That, it just the the way Ghost World is written, even though um, that we've taught that you guys were saying that people that like Ghost World might not like other Klaus works. Mm -hmm. um, just from what I know about Ghost World, that does, this style does seem like something Shia LaBeouf would rip off. Yeah, I mean, it's very, like... Artsy? It, it, yeah, artsy is, like, artsy is such a, like, simple way to put it, but it's also, like, accurate. Like, it is yeah. It is such an artsy thing. And it is, it is, like, revered, you know, among, like, a certain crowd. Yeah, so he knew it was going to be safe. You know, people right. would like it. Have you All seen right. one of his comics in the wild? Uh, well, I'm hey, sorry. What was that? Did you um, did you see um, Shia LaBeouf's uh, Buff's uh, comic book he wrote? I did. I the I have draw. I haven't they seen. Had I, it, I'm sorry. Go on. Go on. I don't want to interrupt you. No, I, I they had it at Star Clipper, I believe. It had like this like really crude drawing of a guy on a motorcycle on the cover. Oh, they actually had it at Star Clipper. It was either at Star Clip or one of the fantasy shops that sure. I'd seen it at. <laughs> yeah, it was I, really. Um... I've never held it in my hands, but I've seen yeah. I've seen like scans of it. Uh, I've seen like some images from it, and it looks amazing. And and I mean that amazing in like an Ed Wood sense. Like, like exactly, it's, it's it is like it it looks like it just like yeah. it completely has no idea what it's doing. Like it doesn't know what it's trying to be. Uh it's it's like a beautiful train wreck. <laughs> so yeah. check that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so if you we'll like, we'll review Dan it Klaus. in an upcoming show. Yeah, if you like Dan Klaus, you'll also like Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, sorry, Shia. He's taken enough of a beating. I don't think he needs us picking on him. Oh, you don't you don't say? <laughs> yeah, I'm right. You're right. Uh, but uh, but yeah. So, Ghost World. Beautiful comic book. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for sitting through another episode of Comic DNA. Uh, my name is Aaron Walther. You can find me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You forgot your name? <laughs> that was the longest. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Go ahead again. I was, I was playing it up for suspense. No, you, you forgot your name. I forgot my name. <laughs> Uh, my name is Aaron Walther. You can find me on Facebook, and I am also on Twitter at A A W A L T H E R. And you can check out my comics at AaronWalther.com and NewHavenComics.com. Luke, as always, you can find me at Facebook uh, and also on Twitter at Luke T Moritz. Um, you can find new episodes of the podcast at ComicDNA.Podbean.com. And Anthony. Yeah, on Twitter, I am at A.R. Mathenia, and uh, check out my books at stashpublishing.com, and by the time this airs, I should have a Kickstarter going, so if you want to check out uh, what I've got coming up, go on there and do a search for Butterfly Flutter. Butterfly Flutter, excellent. Um, if if you, the Kickstarter is up in time, we'll put a link to it in the... Uh in the, the description on the page. Okay. And actually, cool. that also reminds me, uh, by the time this episode airs, I will also have a Kickstarter going for uh, a new book that I'm working on with Chris McJunkin. He's the artist on Zero Zeros. We're going to have a new book called Urban Archer and Abracadiva, and it is a superhero romance comic. So we will 
be let's see yeah that kickstarter will be running by the time this airs so if you like listening to the podcast uh please go donate help me help me get some comics made and one of the rewards that we have available is to be on the podcast so if you donate a certain amount of money you can uh we'll do a whole episode about um you know whatever book you want to be like you can just skype up with me and luke and we'll put you on an episode of comic dna so yeah please uh please please donate to both mine and anthony's kickstarters and uh you will make us very happy people (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and we'll get to make more comic books that's the and that's, important thing that's the important thing is, is making <laughs> more comics and more comics and more comics so thank you everybody for listening and we will see y'all next time adios we didn't say the next episode oh you know what uh, well let me just edit that in there oh, right right, now. right okay blah 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 Go ahead. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, next episode, we are going to be reading Fear Agent by Rick Remainder and Tony Moore. And we are going to have a guest on that episode. It's going to be my good friend, Mr. Josh Blasengame, who is the co-creator and co-writer of a comic that I do, that he and I do, I should say, called Time Agent Z, which is serialized in my, science, my own science fiction anthology, Science Hero. So... Come back. I I like science fiction comics. Luke, I think you're going to like Fear Agent a lot. I really want to read more sci-fi. So that's, yeah, that's so great. excellent, excellent. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll see you all next time. Mm-hmm.